Kabbalah. Oh, how widespread it has become, and how oddly distributed, shifted, and split. To give the most minor of introductions, today I'm remaking one of my original videos, but this time with flair, and further supplemented by what I've learned over the year. Well, not all of it, but the minor points that I think are relevant to beginners in either striking the chord of their desire for spiritual wisdom, or engaging the mind that seeks understanding, pun intended. And really quickly, if you want to learn about metaphysics, practical aspects of the Kabbalah, the secret of numbers, magic spells, and more, then don't forget to subscribe because I'm working on those at this very moment. Alright, let's start at the bottom. Kabbalah, as some people know, is a word meaning the tradition, in reference to the oral tradition and its subsequent depths of knowledge as it relates to the Torah, which is called the written tradition, or first five books of the Bible. The oral tradition is considered delivered over the forty days and nights unto Moses upon Mount Sinai by the divine, directly from mouth to ear. Hence it is called the tradition. Today, we have what may as well be called commoner Kabbalah, a series of artistic renditions of items that are said to house the most ancient secrets, which to some extent they assuredly do in the space of theology and occultism, but with a nuance of mystery since these topics are finally becoming available to the general public. We'll begin our introduction proper with the Tree of Life, the other tree in the midst of the Garden of Eden, likened against the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This attainment of the Tree of Life, properly called Etzheim, is considered to be the pinnacle of humanity's spiritual existence. How do we know that? And what is this spiritual state similar to? Well, it's described in Genesis 3.22, where we find the quote, Lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Emphasizing, and live forever. Let's ask ourselves something briefly. Why is it a tree? Well, the tree is the most proper symbol for a few reasons. Because a great tree sprouting from a seed is much like the mystical imagery described in the Kabbalah as it relates to the creation of the universe. Sure, it is a plant, but in the same vein, it so properly fits the process of creation. The garden flourishes with all manner of foliage, just as the fields and air flourish with all manner of animals. And the crown of creation was mankind. Each level of living things begins with the generative force of two parents, we might even say masculine and feminine energies, who in the Kabbalah are called Abba and Ima. Abba and Ima mean father and mother respectively, and their mysteries are called the Forbidden Degrees, for which we find in Leviticus 18.7, The nakedness of thy father, nakedness of thy mother, shalt thou not uncover. Therefore, we won't be going any further on Abba and Ima aside from displaying their correlation to the Tree of Life, which I will do so very soon after presenting the layout of the tree. Anyway, the depiction of the tree is, at least how it is shown in the side of Lurianic Kabbalah, like so. Well, if you don't know what I mean by Lurianic, uh, it's a man who was named Isaac Luria who lived in the 1500s and he is a famous Kabbalist, a real genius of the sort and mystic grandfather of many Kabbalistic concepts today, like Simzum, which we won't be talking about that herein. Even so, Luria is now also known by the ascribed moniker the Arizal, or the Holy Ari, because of his devout and spiritual powerful nature. He studied many things extensively, yet most of all seems to be the Zohar. If you don't know, the Zohar is a text from the 1200s compiled and put into writing by a man known as Moshe de Leon, but its authorship is attributed to the most famous rabbi, Shimon bar Yochai. But these history lessons are too easily covered on your own time, so let's get back to the basics of the tree. There are ten sferoth in the tree, with a special sphera called Da'at that typically isn't present because of, you know, reasons. Uh, I don't put it because of a few reasons, but one thing you could really ask yourself is why do so many other trees not include Da'at? Like, you know, the question would be, what's missing? <laughs> which, is, uh, which is actually a play on words. Uh, what's missing? It actually answers the question, coincidentally. Okay, but back to it. There are the tens for oath and I'm going to say this slowly and highlight the spheres as I say them. They are Malchuth, Yesod, Hold, 
Netzach, Tiferet, Geburah, Chesed, Bina, Chokmah, and at the peak, Kether. In English, we would see these as, following the same as last time, Kingdom, Foundation, Glory, Victory, Beauty, Judgment, Loving Kindness, Understanding, Wisdom, and Knowing. As you may have noticed, some of these Feroth, or as commonly called Sephiroth in English, are related to each other. The most common correlations are called the Pillars. There are three Pillars, of which we can categorize them, the Pillar of Severity, which is the left-hand pillar, the Pillar of Sweetness or Mercy, which is the right-hand pillar, and finally the Pillar of Balance, which is the middle pillar. Sometimes you'll see the middle pillar also properly called the Pillar of Mercy, and this isn't wrong, because the merciful nature can be distributed upon the left hand, and this is known as sweetening judgment, or appealing to the aspect of mercy, but all of that gets pretty complicated, and we shouldn't be too tedious on basic introductions. We now need to speak on another matter very briefly. One of the most famous books of the Kabbalah is known as Sefer Yetzirah, meaning the Book of Formation, committed to writing or ascribed around the 2nd century AD. In this text, we find some of the most valuable information, specifically of the 32 gates of wisdom. These 32 gates are referential to the Sfaroth and the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Each of the 10 letters are ascribed to one of the paths, rather intersections, between the Sfaroth and the other ten gates being the Sfaroth themselves. Each gate is lightly described in Sefer Yetzirah and appealed to the idea of spiritual ascension through Henosis. Henosis is the idea of unification or being connected together, therefore the ideal interpretation is that the individual is grafted into the spiritual roots of the tree itself, a partaker of its branches thereby elevating the person by drawing down those forces into themselves that they might be expressed in reality. These people also tend to be called converts, coincidentally enough. You may ask yourself, how long does it take for this to occur? Well, quite simply, when a person sleeps, they are elevated to the sphere of Yesod, and descend back down into Malkuth afterwards, and in this space the idea is that their spiritual form is rearranged to match their state of being. So it happens rather quickly, but the issue is more so in actual obtainment, because in the long run, you'll notice this to be far more difficult in execution than it is in theory. A point that should be known is that how can the higher spiritual forms be embodied or drawn inward while a person is within Malkuth, the lowest Feroth? It's an easy question, thankfully, in that Malkuth already houses aspects of the nine upper Sfaroth, thereby engagement with them is experienced as a manner of expressions from the individual. For example, a human being is not naturally in a state of knowing likened to the sphere of Kether, but they can actualize forms of knowledge likened to the sphere of Da'at. They further can attain understanding, the sphere of Bina, of things through knowledge. And with this compoundment of knowledge and understanding, a person may achieve a state of wisdom on certain matters. Of course, this is the experience of these things in physical reality. The supernal forms are much greater in terms of complexity and integration, but this is a simple personal association that we can experience in our lives. You might ask, what of the other Sphiroth? Well, just as the mind rests above the other factors in our body, so too do these three Sphiroth rest above the lower six which are all categorized as emotional sferoth. We can express kindness, judgment, pursue grandeurs of glory and victory, which furthermore set foundations and ultimately culminate as a kingdom, using kingdom by way of license of language, such that we set up a space for ourselves, a reflection of our own form here in physical reality, through active creativity, which we may say is established in the most microcosmic form to all of these much higher spiritual ideals. It's actually a lot more than I originally intended to write on that. You know, we almost got off track for a second. So, remember Abba and Ima from earlier? Abba is attributed to the right-hand pillar. Ima is to the left-hand pillar. Why is that? Well, because the two gender aspects are dually bisected by their inherent difference, which we call the middle pillar. Basically, the feminine aspect is closer to Ima and the masculine to Abba. 
In the creation story of Judaic mysticism, this is immensely important, but all of those pieces are far beyond our current talk. Anyways, let's bring up some more interesting points. The perfected name in Judaic mysticism, as many know, is the four-letter name yod heh vav -Heh. Many people today see this readily as Yahweh or Jehovah, but we don't need pronunciation specifics for this. Each letter is likened to what is called the four worlds. Each world represents a particular form of existence and is also tied symbolically to the tree of life. The four worlds were called, from the top down, Atsiluth, Briah, Yetzirah, and Asiya. These respectively mean emanation, creation, formation, and action. Our current existence is in Malkuth of Asiya. There is Malkuth of the other three worlds, but again, that's a bit much for what we're dealing with currently. So the name, yod heh vav -Heh, has a world for each character, directly related as I'll show on screen. Another point, for the more experience that I see come up time and again, is that the tip of the Yod is seen as what is called the supernal engraving, the first engraving or revealing of all things we consider reality, and this is the fifth world called Adam Kadmon, primordial man. It isn't, in my opinion, a literal fifth world, just the fullness of the other four. It's just a minor distinction in terms of its definition and understanding of it. So you may ask yourself, why are people even curious about the four worlds? Well, because the four is the most primary divisory sign we see in human understanding. The four elements, the four seasons, the four solar events of two equinoxes and two solstices, the four levels of existence in ancient philosophy, which are inanimate, plant, animal, and man. I mean, there's a lot of fours out there if you look for them. But we need to get back onto the typical question, which is us. How does this relate to us? What do we have to do with it? Well, just as the form of man was made from the dust of the earth, so too was his form made in likeness of the higher, for which it says, God made man in his image, in reference to humankind. We contain, in a mystical sense, all the aspects of the Sphoroth in their most minor rendition, their most microcosmic state, which is expressed through the various areas of our bodily functions. We can understand, we can achieve wisdom, we can express kindness and judgment, indications and feelings, preservation, we can set foundations, we can develop the lesser kingdoms of the universe, so to say, in a physical sense. All of which are the revealments of the secret intricacies of the supernal universe, the greater of things above us, the spiritual resting over the material. It is in full understood as spirit over mind over matter, the soul, the consciousness, and the body. These are all the purposes of the Kabbalah, to understand the world, to understand the spiritual spaces, to ultimately understand the purpose of human existence as it relates to the entirety of things, both in physical reality and supernatural reality, which I commonly denote as metaphysics. Notice how many times I said understand though. Three, and that is because the third sphera, that of Bina, is in likeness to that which we call the kingdom, physical reality. Just a little drop of interesting insight to close off what I've been so happy to do. Aside from that, I thank you for joining me and hope to see you around here at the Nimiton, our Grove of Wisdom. Actually, actually, wait, uh, one more thing. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of my older videos and highly recommend that you just check out my newer ones, starting at what is the occult and why I love it. I'm not saying everything beforehand is wrong or anything, it's just so bland by comparison, at least in my opinion. It's, it's just not what I wanted this channel to be when I first envisioned it. The old ones get so many views, but this really poor extended viewership because, you know, yeah, they're not all that great. Anyways, I hope you join me in my more current endeavors, not my humble beginnings. This has been River at the Nimiton. I thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.